All right. I'm sitting here outside my sister's house in Harsjö, uh, outside in Sweden. And uh, I've been playing nine hole golf today. I'm dead tired. I'm waiting for my sister's husband to get the grill going for some barbecue. Is the grill here, though? Yeah, man. Do you have any uh, and if you wonder what language that was, that is weird. Anyway, I decided to put up some YouTube videos on about uh, the work I do. And hopefully you won't to be too distracted by the sounds <laughs> from the people from the ground and uh, the grill, uh, sheep, cook, monster, things going on here. Um, since what I'm going to present and talk about here is basically the same stuff I've been writing up on the... But it's summer, so I've decided to, you know, put up on a video you can see me and talk about. I will talk about um, uh, the things I do in my system, RBIM, stands for Realization Behavior Integration Model. Some people ask me, well, what the hell is that? Well, uh, back in the day I did NLP hypnosis stuff like that and I stopped doing NLP hypnosis and the NLP field told me that I couldn't stop it because if I did learn NLP and hypnosis I couldn't do it uh, because if I had learned it I can't unlearn it and I said you know for a field that's about ex excellence uh, that's kind of a narrow view uh, what I think anyway. so here's the thing is Interflow for me, it's a system from an American called Scott Sono. He's doing tech fit and all this other system. And it's about moving your joints. I've been doing Interflu for about 14 months now, basically daily. I've missed out maybe 15, 20 times, something like that, I don't know. But I'm, I'm doing it daily. So here's the thing, when I'm moving my joints, this is a problem <laughs> I'm doing. I'm moving my wrists, I'm moving my elbows, and I move my shoulder, right? So this is the basic movement I do. I start with my arms like this. I don't do any stretching and I will t tilt the camera a little bit back here so you can see a bit me more here. And, and, and this is the basic system I've been doing for about daily for a year. So when you do this uh, you don't want to do it with sport, you don't want to do it with ease so you can uh, you know, feel the movement. And since I've been playing nine holes of golf, I've been doing So this is what I've been doing for, well, then I do some for the hip and for the knee. And I often do some hip at the end. And this is basically the routine I've been running through. When I started doing Interflow, I got my arm about this. Right now I can, you know, and I haven't done any stretching. So mo mobility and uh, lubricate your joints, stuff like that. Letting, you know, the motions. You can do this in a different way. The thing here is when you start doing interflow daily, you can do it there between the commercial break and watching TV or whatever. It takes about five minutes to do or less. And the, the key is to work with within the an increase in the move motion and mobility. Uh, because once you do this we start to get more and more fluid here. You can do a little bit more. 
work your butt up like that. Anyway. Once I've been doing that for about, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes. Normally it's just a five, 10, 15 minute workout. And for me that's uh, get pulse. When I focus on my body as it moves, and if I'm extra stiff somewhere, I don't work. Uh, if I'm a little bit stiff here in my neck here due to the golf, so I will more work on this side where my body. For me, this means uh, over the year that I've been doing it that my stress levels has gone down. Uh, I don't get after a long workout a lot of pain in my joints. I can sleep at night without taking painkiller, working out in the middle of the night because my joints hurt. Uh, uh, being ill as I've been over the years uh, takes a, a big toll on me. So if you are uh, uh, having uh, yourself a uh, problem with CFS, is the chronic fatigue system syndrome, uh, or if you have a friend who has something like that, they're tired all the days, I recommend to, to, to teach them and to learn the interflow system of Scott Tone. Because it's a great system. It, it, you, you don't need to go to the gym or pack your bags or clothes. And you can do it at your home. Uh, do it between the commercial breaks. You can do sitting down if you want. It's about increasing the mobility of the joints. And you will get a big, huge boost about after three months we do daily. And that's the common dom dom dominator of what I've been experiencing when I'm teaching to other people to, to do this move like this. And you get a more free flow. So, I don't do any stretching anymore, so this is why. Okay. NLP, for example, is a field about the subjective experience of, you know, people who did excellence. Back in 1970, excellence in NLP, or in 1980, 1990s, 2000, it's, uh, the excellence is not the same, because you have to change over the years. But the same thing here is, when I'm trying to teach people about what I'm doing in my work, that talk about an uh, iconic experience. People go like, what, what do you mean by When you have the experience, you don't make them run any comparison. What people say, what, what do you mean by that? Because when you have that kind of experience, it's different than what you normally experience your daily life, unless you're one of the few who can really can do this, either by accident or by practice, uh, some training system, teaching system, all that. Uh, when I was, uh, putting up on the internet and stuff like that, uh, just Rigio, uh, the guy with the Middle South program, called me up and said that, you know, I, I'm running a two-day show in Denmark. This was back in 2004. So uh, he asked me to come there and we, uh, write about that stuff. And then um, when I was there, I liked what he was doing. I told him that. And um, uh, I was one of three at the time that uh, ran this model through in the first explosion. A lot of the people there had like, you know, two days of LP training and they couldn't understand it because when people had the experience in the workshop, they couldn't understand they had the experience. So basically, uh, they were deleting uh, whatever was going on because they couldn't understand that they had a new experience that was not, you know, what they, whatever they are, did have before, whatever you call it. So here's the key. So, which I've been working on for about uh, a lot, lot of years right now, right? So here's the key. How come you can elicit an experience with an individual? They can have the experience, but they can't understand the habit. The reason why is you don't have any comparison. No comparison mode. You don't compare at the same time. Because when people are exposed to an idea, like RBIM, okay, Robert, what's RBIM about? Well, it's about this stuff. So people go thinking, okay, so you're trying to understand that you make a comparison. You can't do that, because if you do that, you don't understand the system. You know, you need to have the kind of proper comparison. Hi there. I'm taping. And my sister's kid came home. Uh, he's the guy who was running motorcycles into the woods, and more, more often than not, he's crashing than actually driving them. Uh, so 
accident happens. <laughs> At least with him. Anyhow, um, because when you have uh, this kind of associated or identified experience with the context, you are the context. There is just one singularity, like you also like to say, or oneness or whatever you call it. You don't make a comparison because you're running your own internal context. So the, the information that comes from other people or the context around me or people, uh, the dog screaming and barking, uh, other people walking around, that doesn't matter because what I'm trying to do here, Grace, is to, you know, talk about my line of work here. So it, since for me NLP is about excellence, I love NLP, uh, don't get me wrong on that, uh, I love it. It's a great system for some things you can do in your life and all that stuff. But the problem is the education NLP sucks. I mean, you, when you have students who, who, who talk to me that, you know, I've been learning this NLP from you and I met this other guy who had been to a training program and he can't do this stuff. And I say, yes, I know, I told you that, that other people, you know, who come from other NLP training institutes that can't do it. Yeah, but I'm kind of surprised that they're so bad, you know. They couldn't do it, they could talk about it. Or, you know, illustrate some of the things. And you know, so this guy, he works as a lawyer. Uh, he's in the law school and all that stuff. So he had this client. He's, the client he has been taking a lot of alcohol, drugs, and all this. He hears voices. He has a lot of voices screaming at him in his head. And he told me that if he had this client, you know, he was, you couldn't talk to him. So he, when he was doing that, he elicited every voice that he had, told them to shut them out. And after about 20 minutes of work, he could talk to the guy. He could make him having a suit. Could present him into the court, and uh, I bet he won the case also. Uh, because he said, you know, you can't go and get it, go into the court when you have someone you know, basically lunatic. This is a lawyer who learned what I was doing, so he can apply that in his job. He didn't work with the, you know, in the therapy or coaching or something. Like that. He was working with clients to make them, you know we in the court case. That's the thing you can do with NLP if you want. Uh, but, but the way I was teaching NLP, you know, you have to be able to understand it. You have to be able to, you know, in some extent, apply it. Uh, and, and I don't, uh, when I'm trying to teach people in my training program, was that you, you, you should be able to do something. Now, I didn't teach people about a lot of other things that I didn't consider to be important in NLP because what, what I was paid to do was teach them how to do things. Some of the things that the people are, are learned to do in NLP is not, they, they can't do anything, but they, they have a lot of information, it's kind of cool stuff and all that stuff. Anyway, that's uh, NLP. What's about RBIM then? What's going on here? Well, so what's an iconic experience? Iconic experience you don't run in a comparison. Cool, what's that like? Well, that's the thing. What it's like is that you don't run, run in a comparison. So you can't understand what it's like so I was having a sandwich with my um, pre-course dinner and we're going to have a barbecue here and stuff like that. So uh, the thing here, what, what I'm trying to tell you here is about when you're doing RBIM, the, to understand it you can't make the comparison. So obviously we get a paradox here. So to understand it you have to have the experience because uh, if you try to understand it you're always going to make a comparison. So you're evidently going to run into a loop. And the loop happens because of the context you're involved with. Uh, you have two contexts, so you need to have one context. And the thing here is when I was working with this over the years, that for me it was, if I could elicit the experience and the individual could not understand they had a new experience, I was like, you know, I can't understand why don't they recognize. Because the thing here is that they couldn't make the comparison. So since they couldn't make the comparison, they didn't know they had a new experience. And so, so, so this means that when they have the experience, they try to get out of the experience to make the comparison, so then they can understand, oh, I had the experience. Which means, you know, you're on an infinite loop then. So that, that's kind of, if you ask me, human brains, basically. That's how the brain works, because uh, back in, you know, age four, when the brain has started to mature enough, you get to the point where you start to understand where well, I'm different from my parents and I'm different from other people and all that stuff. There's a difference then 
because you understand it's not the same anymore. And a lot of my work goes off to teach people to get back more likely into the kind of childlike experience that you're just having one experience, it doesn't matter what kind of experience going on around you. And to um, run that. And this has come from Roy Fraser, who's run the generative imprint back in the day. That you're always trying to do at your best. So when you do anything, whatever it is you do in your life and work and all that stuff, you do it from a point of uh, doing all, all the time as the best you can do. And this is not just a try to do the best, you actually come from the inside if you like. You're running the experience that you do this to run your own perfect experience, for example, your best experience or whatever you call it, all the time. So you run that and have that kind of experience whenever you engage in something. So sometimes people ask me, you know, how, do, how should I learn stuff? Well, you do a future pacing, like an LP, that you imagine you're already be able to do it. That's one step. Well, okay, I can imagine that. Okay, then you have run it so you can do it, so you have the experience of doing that. Okay? And that's not future pacing then. Then you are actually building a new reality in in advance so when you have that kind of experience for you the reality then is like this is how it is now for me. when I the people go like so and then, and then the, 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 the client will tell you the invalid will tell you that this is how it is now and I go like but you haven't done it yet but since they have the experience of being, being able to do it already for them they look at me like you know what, what do you mean I, I can do it but you have never done it I don't, that, I don't mind. I already know how to do it, and they go out and then they're able to do it. And and a lot of people don't think what's going on because you build a new reality. You can have the skill set of whatever you're doing, a lot of sub skills and sub skills and all that stuff. But if you talk about excellence, you are able to do your own best experience or your own best uh, expression or your own best, you know, whatever you call it all the time or at the time you want to do it. A lot of people say, well, how, how do I do it? But you can't think about it because if you're thinking about it, you have all this comparison going on then it doesn't work. So you have to build the iconic experience so you don't have any comparisons and you have to understand what that kind of experience is like so when you have it, you recognize it and just go with the flow. So, so that you just go with it, you just run around. I was writing about in the blog post uh, recently, uh, yesterday, or something like that, about um, I had a golf pro, a coach, and I helped him to change his swing in three weeks. And it took three weeks to, for him to go from his old swing to, to the new swing. And for him, the shift was really easy, really fast, really smooth. You can't do that normally. People tell me that it's, uh, swing change takes two years. And I say, yes, it does if you do it the way people normally do. But if you do it my way, it goes a lot, lot faster. That doesn't mean, you know, if you don't have the skill as an approach, it won't be that fast, but it will be a lot faster if you do it the approach I'm using. So, and the key thing here is when people try to change, they try to change the current context, the current underlying condition. And that is not a good approach. That's a, I call it a problem-oriented solving approach. What you do is to elicit the new future where things work. And uh, people go like, well, I, the reality is this, this is how my reality is. And I go like, I don't care. Because what, what you want to have is kind of experience when things are the way you want it to be. And nothing in the outside world needs to happen for you to have that kind of experience. That is just about by, by far by how most people run their life that whenever things happen in the outside world, Race. like the dogs coming here and all that stuff you know so uh, most people you know take the outside world and make them feel good versus uh, depressed uh, happy whatever uh, and if those things doesn't happen happens in the world they feel miserable basically so you have to take charge or control of that that you you run your own experience and when you run your own experience that it's stable and all that you can do whatever you want to do and apply that in your life and all that stuff. So the key here is, so how do I do that? Well, I will have a lot of talks about this in the 
uh, in, in, on YouTube. I will load up. I did an interview today. I'll be a little bit talking here. Uh, it's summer, so I was thinking it's a good time to. The, the thing I did with the three weeks for a change of swing is the approach I use is that I'm telling him to do the same thing he's already been doing. He's he, hitting the target and he's doing the same thing. And I tell him to do that and then wait out the new change he wants to do. The, whatever the hip is going to do or the arms or the hands or the legs or whatever it is. So he do that, it takes him about three days to shift and to make the addendum. He can, so for him, he's already doing the same thing he's been doing for about 15, 20 years ago. But now he's incorporating a totally new motion to do that. And for him, it took about three weeks. And from that on, he's been able to improve and improve on that and refine it. Most people, when they try to do a change, it's to change the, you know, how the angle of uh, the, the hip or uh, arms or elbows or whatever. I mean, that's, if you do it that way, it takes a long time to do a change. About two years. From, uh, a lot of repetition and stuff like that. Too long for me. So, because I'm asked, uh, I was asking myself this kind of question that how do I make an elicitization of, of the experience and make the individual aware of the new experience. Now, that's the, one of the things that I've been working on the last few years, that how do I make the individual becoming aware of their own experience? And I found out that most people are not aware of their own experience in any moment of time. Most people don't check them. They wake up in the morning, go to job, you know, get home, do things in their free time, uh, have family, whatever, you know, free time hobbies and that's life for most people most people don't calibrate their own experience most people don't check their own experience most people just you know react to life and whatever you call it so what i'm trying to do here is to teach people that you have to do for example into flow in for about three months before you get the real benefit and a lot, that's a lot of take on faith you know do i need to do this every day for three months and go well, yes and it take less than five minutes to do it and it's easy to do also, right? Oh, I don't want to do that. And we're like, oh, okay. Why should I teach you anything else? Well, I want something fast and easy. And I think that a lot, a lot of people can do that. But once we're able to do this, it's it's not just fast and easy. It's even better quality of experience. So you're talking about excellence there, which is my running team today. If you're running excellence in NLP, you, you're like me in some way that it, it, uh, I assume when someone say excellence that they're able to uh, pull off the, uh, whatever it is in, in an excellent way. They have some kind of criteria that they use to be excellent, not to be average as uh, anyone else. No. You get always a problem if you have enough people who do the excellence, actually, all right? Then that becomes the new standard. That becomes the new standard of excellence. Obviously, then it's not excellent anymore. Then it's just average even though the level of uh, performance is a lot higher. And you see that in a lot of sport, you see that in music. Um, in music, a lot of people are practicing a dif different way now, so that they can uh, do music pieces that takes maybe two years before, or six months or something like that. They can do it a lot, a lot faster. There's a great book about um, from Daniel Coyle called The Talent Code, where it was um, uh, looking at people and all over the world and you know, how they, they practice and one of the key things he was finding that what when people did practice quality time they had this deep focused intense concentration where they were doing things you know and if they did that they accelerated the technique or performance with weeks or months in a few hours so, so obviously something is going on, what's going on? And I, and I tell people that when you do this kind of deep correct focus, what happens is you isolate the context. So you're inside the context of your performance and trying to, you know, if you're doing the violin, you're trying to perfect, uh, you know, the motor control of the fingers to make a, 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 a transition extra smooth, but you can't really get it. So you spend, you know, um, two hours, you're really dedicated and everything else, just, you know, it's not there, you, you don't uh, eat, you don't uh, hear everything, you know, it's all the way 
it's just this moment when you're trying to get that perfect. And when you get that perfect, you can play that piece. Suddenly your skill set is expanded and you can really do it. Now, the talent code uh, describes that. And when I'm working with the clients and I'm coaching golf or athletes and stuff like that, I'm trying to make them to, to do their own best experience with their own best performance. And you need to have a skill set, and you need to build an operation in the, in the, right, in the, in the skill set. And you have to isolate the context when you're working. Context for me is, is about the same thing you're thinking about. That's context. You're thinking about a dog, or an orange apple, uh, orange apple, or a, a blue car, or a, the grass is red, or whatever you call it. Uh, doesn't matter. That's context. That's not a, just a representation, that's context. And it makes it much easier. Time, for example, is context. You have future time, you have normal time, you have past time, you have uh, whatever, present time. Uh, and that's kind of different context also because when you talk to people and they're, they're stressed out for something, they're, you know, they're going to do something, they're stressed out because they don't have enough time. And the time they have is the time you always have, right? So how come they have uh, less time? Well, because they're running a different way of you know, time distortion, uh, people say, right? So if I'm telling people, well, let's say you already made made the dinner, you already made the thing you're going to do. And they go like, yeah, it, does, it hasn't happened yet, but you, you're already done. Okay, if you have that kind of experience while you're going to prepare for dinner or prepare all that stuff, how will that affect your experience when you're preparing all that stuff? And people go, well, how? That would be like, oh, yeah. There will be no stress at all. You know, I could just enjoy the moment and what I'm doing and what I'm seeing. And I go, why not do that instead? And they go, like, can I do that? Yes. You can always do that if you want to. So, what most people do is to run patterns they've already been doing for a long time. But excellence, for example, as a pattern, is means that you can't do whatever you've been doing for a long time. You have to excel to do even better over time. But since most people run a closed loop in, in the way of their own reality and experience, they don't have this kind of loop when you're, everything is just you know, expanding and, and you just keep on you know, improving whatever you're doing. So over time you get a lot, lot better if you do it this way. Because you're starting at the excellent, you're doing the even more excellent. After a while you do it excellently because you're continu continuously improving on the same thing, so you get a lot, lot better. And uh, after a while, you achieve what some people call mastery. You achieve what people call, you know, uh, really good level of performance, stuff like that, right? The thing here is that most people don't do that. They're, people are trying to make something happen. I was working with a kid today at the golf range before I went out. He was a young kid, um, I don't know, 16, 14, 16, something like that. And I was hitting some golf. I was start talking to him about what I was doing. And I started helping him about that and spent an hour with him, just making him hit the ball better. And he was able to go for, to the new experience, which he needed to have to be able to hit the ball that way. And it felt, for him, it felt kind of normal, even though it was totally brand new. So, so I was just you know, playing around with the idea of the ball swing and all that stuff. So, <clears throat> the thing here is, if you try to understand you must make a comparison. And that's not what I'm doing in today or teaching today. Or something. But I'm teaching you to have the experience, not to understand it. So when you have the experience, you go like, oh, this is how my experience is. Yes, it will be it. Oh, okay. I didn't know it was like this. And then go, yes, I know. So you have to build that kind of experience and you have to build a contextual reference in that. Form your, uh, we can call it identity, we can call it uh, expression of self, uh, whatever you you have it. You have to have that kind of, you know, expression when you have this kind of uh, experience. Uh, in the golf I coach, I build a skill set for him, I help him build the, the skill set of a really, really precision golf. And I organize, help him organize that kind of skill set into an identity to be that kind of golfer he always wanted to be play the golf there so always wanted to be. So he made that shift and about two weeks ago he's organized that kind of golfing skill set and golfing uh -huh, and golfing experience in that kind of experience. Uh, 
few days ago he played uh, 18 holes, he had 9 birdies in 15 holes, he made 5 birdies in a row and he played basically the best game of his life. So uh, he's going to qualify for a British Open now, so we'll see how the count goes on Monday. It's a tough, I mean it, to get into that, uh, it's, 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 uh, the qualification is really do or die kind of situation. Anyway, what I'm trying to convey here is today anyway is about interflow. Do the interflow, do it every day, do it in range of motion, increase your mobility, you'll feel better and it will increase your uh, longevity, it will help you uh, become more healthy, it will do a lot of good for you. And when I'm talking about, you know, experience and stuff like that, you can ask questions on my blog and I will try to answer them and give my opinion about that stuff. Um, um, what else? Um, the, the food is ready, so I'm going to get some grilled chicken and stuff like that. Pretty tasty, by the way. I'm, I'm hungry. I played nine holes and I was about six hours ago I was eating breakfast, so I'm, I'm hungry and tired and I'm just running out of steam here, so for me, uh, this is uh, the best I can do at the moment. Anyway, um, RBIM is about you be able to realize your own behavior and the experience you have when you have this kind of, you know, experience, economic experience. And when you have that kind of, you know, awareness, you integrate that so you know, you understand this is how it's, it is like for myself running my own experience in whatever I'm doing. So when I'm exposed to other people or decisions or environment and all that stuff, you understand and recognize your own system, your own signal, or your own, you can call it congruence if you like. You understand this is me, this is where I'm coming from, this is how I am operating, you know, in this, with my friends, my family, with the workplace, the home, stuff like that, you know. So if you have that kind of signal, you recognize that, you understand also that it's much easier to make a decision because when you're presented with the information then from other sources and other environment, the context and all that, you understand that this is not for you or this is for you because it will either match this kind of congruence or uh, expression of your you know, signal in the system. So you will start to do more of that. And after a while you get more excellent from doing that and more excellent from doing that. After a while you have to run in an open loop. So you just can continuously improve on that kind of experience. Does that mean that everything in life will be perfect? Absolutely nothing. If we are lucky uh, and the global warming doesn't, you know, kill us, uh, because the global warming is basically uh, a heat cooking device that the sun will, you know, uh, we will block out. Either we get so hot on Earth, so we will be like a boiled frog, or it's the other way around. It goes so far; it's going to be so cold. Either way, uh, a lot of millions of billions of people are going to die in that case. And uh, unless that happens, um, I fully expect to uh, have a lot of fun. And I think you should have a lot of fun also. And I'm going to make some barbecue now, grilled chicken and salad, and enjoy the time with my sister's family and her friends and her husband's uh, parents and stuff like that. Till the next time, ask a question, get back.